Room 237 and kind of got a bit of a random uh, review. This is a movie that I've wanted to see for quite some time. It came out this year. <clears throat> um, and it's one I've heard about and just on the premise and the whole backdrop of it, I really wanted to see it. Now, it's not quite a movie like Abracadabra or Strange Color Your Body's Tears or even The Editor, which is a Canadian uh, Jallo satire. But it, some people are calling it a Jallo or Neo Jallo. Uh, that's another one where you should correct people if you see people calling it a Jallo. You can see the inspiration in there. But uh, it's a 2021 film, Censor, <clears throat> which is the debut film by uh, Prano Bailey Bond, or Prano Bailey Bond, who previously had just done some short films, one of which is one called Nasty, which is kind of the short film precursor uh, to this written by her and Anthony Fletcher and stars Neam Algar if I pronounce that correctly she's been in some television she's an Irish actress she was in an episode of Vikings of uh, Nicholas Burns Vincent Franklin Adrian Schiller and Michael Smiley <clears throat> uh, cinematography by Anika Summerson music by Emily Levanese Feroche, if I pronounce that correctly. And uh, I don't I don't even really know how this was released. I don't think it got a theatrical release, but uh which is really frustrating because this is a damn good movie. I really enjoyed this. But it it did premiere at Sundance and it got the it won the award for best european fantastic film now what intrigued me about this is it takes place uh, i don't think it uh, 1985 which one it it actually has the balls to set a movie in the 80s and not go full on stranger things with the nostalgia it just looks like everyday things in the 80s I mean yeah people smoking inside kind of dressing like the 80s not like a pop no no one's dressed in parachute pants or anything but you know there's not like posters of Ghostbusters everywhere stuff like that you know it's very straight and our main character uh, uh, Enid played by uh, Alger she's a censor for the British Board of Film Classification and determining what film should be pulled and banned as part of the video nasty craze now it's not it doesn't really delve that deep into the video nasty era or hysteria it shows it, but um, it's more so a backdrop. And she comes across this one film called Don't Go Into the Church, made for this. It, <clears throat> which I'll get into the films made within the film because they deserve credit. She comes across this one film, Don't Go Into the Church, that uh, mirrors events of her past that she has since uh, repressed, which is the disappearance of her sister. She becomes obsessed and tries to, you know, always believing her sister was still out there, tries to find her. You know, tries to find the director, this mysterious director of this film, thinks it's... Uh, uh, an actress that's in a number of his films and it, it goes on from there uh, without getting into spoilers but you know one thing so yes there is a mystery so there's some but 
is also a very well-made visual experience. I mean, you have some like Argento colors being used and I can see why people would see the Giallo influence, but I think it's just more so inspired by the horror films of the time, which there, there was some Giallo, like I know Tenebrae was one that was banned. Suspiria, which is not a Giallo, was another one. In fact, one documentary I'm going to recommend is, and there's two parts, I don't have part two, but uh, it's called The Definitive Guide, but I think the actual title is uh, Moral Panic, Censorship, and Videotape. This is a three disc set, and disc two and three are all trailers, but for all 39 films that were banned and prosecuted, and the 33 that were banned but not prosecuted, and I think later acquitted. So 72 films total went through this process that our main character does. And, you know, it incorporates a lot of the filmmaking styles of that time. Like I said, the Argento colors. And, in fact, the, the films that they show that they made for this looks just like movies that came out at that time. You know, normally, <clears throat> you'll be able to tell, like, a movie made in 2020, 21. If, if this was made by anybody else, you could probably say, oh, okay, they made that for this, and they're trying to make it look like it came out in the 80s. The ones that they're uh, reviewing for censorship, I mean... Which there's one, there's Don't Go in the Church, and then there's another one. I can't remember the name name of. It's the one that she rents <clears throat> from the video store. And, but <clears throat> they did such a good job. Don't Go in the Church looks like if Argento directed Evil Dead. That's what that movie looks like. <clears throat> the one that she rents from the video store looks just like a Fulci film. I mean, Shrouded in Chat. The actress she sees, Alice Lee, is the, the actress's the character's name. Like when she's she's studying this actress, thinking it's her sister, but when she's on the screen, it's like all shadow except for like here. You know, it looks just like an attempt, especially a full chi film. You know, you can definitely tell that um, Bailey Bond really knows. You know, horror films of that era definitely is well versed in the video nasty era and then there's some side plots like people are really upset with Enid because she let this one movie slip a movie called Deranged which is a real movie that's kind of inspired by the Ed Gein case she let that slide and now there's this killer called the amnesia killer who <laughs> killed and ate his wife and kids and so now it it kind of shows the moral panic you know she's getting all, th all these death threats saying it's her fault for letting the movie go and but it, it doesn't go too heavy on it which I like you know it kind of keeps it as a backdrop and it's more of a character study. I'm sure, I don't know why I'm holding this up. <laughs> Probably out of habit. Um, you know, I'm sure there's people that are thinking it's going to be a slasher throwback. We really only get like two kills. But it's not a slasher. It's not about the kills. It's more of a character study. You know, a movie like Maniac or a Driller Killer. Which, the opening credits has with really degraded VHS quality shots of Driller Killer, Frightmare, uh, Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. So that was really cool. And Algar carries this movie. I mean, it. her performance is, one, very great. And I loved her performance in this. It kind of reminded me of Elizabeth Moss in the new Invisible Man just as far as just 
in in the sense of just how far she's pushing herself. I mean, as the movie goes on, you can tell she's just <laughs> on the fringes of sanity. You know, her hair's kind of stringy. She's got bags under her eyes. She's doing, like, these ticks, like, picking at a hangnail. You can just tell she's losing it, and she did a fantastic job with it. Great performance. Um, you know, her, the the opening credits has like a goblin esque score. The score is also worth mentioning because it's mostly just this ominous, you know, the dark, moody. Really helps the atmosphere. It kind of reminded me of like it follows. Well, actually, the movie as a whole, really, but the score as well but um it is this very slow burn uh you know kind of shows the 80s without all the nostalgia uh great tone and atmosphere great score only where that it follows is more of like a supernatural type film this one is more kind of your video nasty i guess kind of jello kind of slasher but not really about the kills it is about the mystery what happened to her sister I, I i have to go into spoilers early because so much i want to talk about <coughs> kind of gives it away and i don't want to do that i highly recommend this film i don't own it but i watched it on hulu so if you have hulu I'm not sure where else it's playing, but I definitely recommend it. Uh, and then just the more, the more the film goes on, the more it, it does kind of uh, in it blurs the line between reality and sort of what's going on in her head. And her, she has a few dreams that mirror both the Don't Go in the Church movie and her past. When we see those dreams, they are very well shot. Lots of purples. Uh, you know, it's out in the woods. There's like slow motion of running through the trees. <clears throat> A great looking Evil Dead cabin, you know, with just that kind of uh, exorcist poster light shining through the windows and the doorway. So they did a very excellent job with the the films within the film the dream sequences but as the film goes on the film itself becomes that style you know it's shot very straight for the most part kind of in the beginning and as but as it goes I mean by the end or towards the end it looks like Suspiria I mean very bright you know reds and blues and very artistic uh also uh, i i'm not quite sure at what point but the aspect ratio starts going into a four three which i think is just supposed to show how everything is closing in on her or how we're kind of narrowing in on just it's it's not one of those artistic things for no point, but it also kind of makes it look kind of vhs -y as it does that. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to talk about without <coughs> getting in spoilers, but, you know, she's also trying to convince her parents that this actress might be her sister. Her parents have declared her sister dead, but, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not... And the whole movie was shot in primarily 35 millimeter, and it looks fantastic. There's some uh, eight millimeter or Super 8 and VHS as well, and it looks awesome. Uh, you know, I I really give credit to the director for knowing her shit about video nasties. And one thing I'll say is. No, I can't say that yet. But it's a very stylish treat. 
And again, I can see why people would call it a neo jalo or even more incorrectly, a jalo. It is visually stylish, it is a mystery, but it's an English film. But yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna have to get into spoilers, <coughs> but I highly recommend it. And I, I can't give enough credit to the lead performance, the the score, the cinematography. I love. Also, there are, there are some kind of nostalgic parts. Like for me, my favorite part of my childhood was going to the video store. The, it does kind of show what people in England had to do, because um, she when she's looking into this director. She goes to the video store. She's trying to get the clerk to rent her some Frederick North films. That's the name of the director. And, you know, at that time, video stores were being raided and shut down. Uh, clerks and proprietors were being arrested, having their films seized. So they were keeping these films out back or behind the counter. So she had to, like, kind of talk about these scenes and you know saying like well my favorite film by him was uh stationary massacre you know when the guy kept getting stabbed in the stomach and his guts fell out and they got it stapled back up you know she's seen it because she had to censor it and also she's like super hardcore about censorship like she really wants to stop all this but also um because one of the taglines is you can't edit reality and it does kind of it, it does kind of draw a parallel with her being a film censor and cutting stuff out of a film and also kind of how she's repressing certain memories there's this great dialogue scene with this co-sensor that she has when she brings up that amnesia killer and she's like how can you forget like uh, how can you forget doing certain things because he said he didn't remember killing his wife and kids i guess and the guy says it, it must have been trauma you know, some trauma can just turn your brain off and you can you know it, it can just block it out implying that's probably what happened with her and her, the disappearance of her sister. And she's saying like, how can anyone forget something traumatic? Even though that is what she did and now she's editing traumatic things out of film. And I, I thought it was handled very well. It wasn't too, you know, it wasn't done in a pretentious way. It, it wasn't heavy. I, I thought it worked very well. And, uh, again, I gotta save that for spoilers. <laughs> uh, I'm not used to having a bulk of a movie be <laughs> not being able to talk about till after spoilers. But, yeah, I really like how, and again, at first it's just the movies within the film and the dream sequences that are very stylish, but as it goes on it blends and you can't really tell until all of reality is like that. The climax was awesome and very haunting. I mean, the the very last scene is pretty chilling and very well done. So I guess I don't really have any choice but get the spoilers now. So I, I can actually talk about some other stuff, but yeah, find wherever it's playing or buy the DVD. I'm actually gonna go out and buy it at some point I loved this movie, and uh, I also recommend this documentary. But yeah, it's, I mean, I guess it's an 80s throwback, because it also does feel like an 80s horror movie as well, like It Follows. And yes, I, I did think it was like Nightcrawler and Enemy with Jake Gyllenhaal, because I know people are gonna say in the comments, uh, uh, I suggest or recommend you check these out. 
as if I've never heard of them. Yes, I, I did see the, the parallels. And yeah, those are also good movies. But yeah, I'm going to get into spoilers. Great movie. So I guess I should have mentioned there were a couple things that kind of took me out of it. Both of which, ironically enough, were the kills themselves. Um, there's this one film producer in the beginning that comes in, kind of hits on her and says, I'm a, I'm a producer for Frederick North. He wanted you personally to review this film. Don't go in the church. <clears throat> and that's kind of what kicks off the whole thing. At some point, you know, when, you know, now she's trying to find the actress in order to find her. She's got to find the director. There's not much on him. She can't really access a lot of information. So she goes to the producer's house. And she's trying to ask questions about this actress, Alice Lee. <clears throat> and, you know, he's just saying, like, uh, you know, her next picture, the sequel to Don't Go in the Church, is going to be her last film. Of course, by this point, she's kind of really loose in reality. So, in her mind, her sister's been abducted and now forced to act in these movies. So then the producer tries hitting on her more. And he grabs her. There's a struggle. She pushes him off of her, and he falls backwards. And he showed this award that he got, which is like a trophy of like a guy holding up an axe and it pans up you know it shows him laying on the table and it pans up and we see that his head landed on the award and went through and he's like it was coming out of his mouth and he's gagging on it and blood's coming out which one it is an over the top kill and tonally it just didn't fit I mean, she could have just grabbed it and bashed him in the head with it. That probably would have been more appropriate. And again, I'm a gore hound. But I get they had to make it traumatic. Because after that, there's this... She does this great performance where it shows her kind of... Like, trying to shake it off. It's like, you, you could see her literally repressing the trauma. And she even says, you know... It thanks him for the whiskey. It says, I'll, I'll show myself out like it didn't even happen. And this was after she had that conversation about how can you forget things and you know, traumatic, not realize that you did something horrible. <clears throat> but the way that was shot, like, they didn't use a prosthetic or anything. And yeah, some of the blood is CGI. But it's like, it's that old trick where you can tell it's just like on the side of his head. Which, maybe they did that because that's how like an 80, like a low budget 80s movie would have shot it. But at that point, it doesn't switch over to the old quality that we've been seeing or the style. So maybe if they had mixed that, it would have looked like a... <laughs> a schlocky 80s kill but instead the it, it looks like the rest of the movie prior so it really kind of looks out of place but I get they had to make it over the top and traumatic to really show that she is gonna you know kind of repress it and act like it didn't happen but so then she finds out where this set is because that sequel is being shot at that point. So she goes right into this office, st steals a file with North's address on it. It's this trail. She finds this trailer out in the woods. This very 80s looking woman, Debbie, comes out, assumes she's an actress. So they started giving her hair and makeup. And, you know, she notices the pictures on the wall of Alice Lee. She keeps asking about Alice Lee. 
they get her in the costume. Oh, and also in her dreams and visions of her sister, which I didn't even talk about her memory. It shows the two of them as young girls out in the woods. There's this cabin. I guess she convinces her to go in the cabin. And then that's all it shows for it. And sometimes it hints at this sort of hulking caveman looking beast. Which I think the characters call like uh, man beast or something <laughs> in the movie. I don't know if that's just like something that she made up or something that she kind of. Because there's also something that hints that she's taking things in. Uh, I'll just save it for the end. Uh, I'll just finish up what happens in the movie. She She's going to go do this scene with the director. And of course, we're supposed to believe he's this dark, mysterious director that could have taken her sister and forcing her to endure all this. Um, so he's, he's trying to get her into character, but she's taking it as like a real kind of psycho say like there's a darkness in, in you give me your worst impulses and she's kind of telling him no so he's getting pissed but finally gets her in character she goes in the trailer where that beast guy is and alice lee and the scene is like the beast has alice she uh Enid has the axe and just when she's about to be like I'll save you the guy's like uh, this isn't in the script she axes him right in the chest and then that's when Alice is like what are you doing why and then it shows like the the wound on his chest and there's like a mouth in there that says I am the horror that's when we can pretty much tell she's pretty much lost it and she just just axes the hell out of him. Which mirrors what we see in Don't Go In The Church. Because Don't Go In The Church, I think, implies that the older sister killed the younger sister with an axe. And so... And she's axing the guy in the same kind of camera angle and way as Don't Go In The Church. Could be implying that maybe she did that to her sister as well. And, and that's what she repressed. And maybe this man beast thing is the story she came up with. They took her and that's what her parents believe. But that's another thing about this movie is it's pur purposely ambiguous. It doesn't just come out and say this is what happened with her. It, it helps us see it through her eyes more. Because it doesn't show what she doesn't remember. It's more implications and stuff like that. Which I, I'm i perfectly fine with ambiguity. I know a lot of people are not. I know there's going to be people saying, Well, we need an origin story so we can see what happens. Or we need a sequel so we know what happens to her. It's like, no, we don't. We, we can have a very well-made good movie with ambiguity. We don't need answers to everything so that's when the director comes in and you know that's when you can tell everyone around her it is a movie set so then Alice runs off uh, Enid chases her and now it's full Argento mode I mean she's like shrouded in blue light with blood on her the, the woods all around her are in like this red light it looks gorgeous <clears throat> it's nighttime and she's trying to tell Alice like oh, I, I'm your sister I'm your sister she's like no you're not it's like yo I've been looking for you forever Alice finally runs off Enid just breaks down repeating please be her please be her and then there's this great bright light. And it looks like Alice is walking towards her, smiling. And then we see them in the car together. It's this, again, 
like the brightest summer, happiest looking film you've ever seen. Very vibrant colors, kind of slow motion driving. We hear on the radio that all video nasties have been eradicated. Uh, you know, crime is all the way down, unemployment's all the way down. And she's just sitting there smiling. She still has blood and shit on her. She pulls up to her parents' house. Again, all this very nice, slow motion. Her parents are standing there smiling. Alice goes out. They they both get out. They stand there smiling at their parents. And she's like, I found her. Alice runs towards them and they embrace. There's like a big rainbow over the house. But sporadically there's these little glitches kind of like, like when a tape is scratched like these little where it shows the reality it's these v staticky VHS quality of a blood covered Alice screaming for help and the parents looking at her like what's going on so you get those little tiny glimpses that just kind of crack in a few times and the way it's done is pretty chilling. It's it's definitely the most haunting part of the movie. As Enid just stands there smiling and we get the idea she's completely in her head right now. And after she killed that beast man, she must have totally snapped, abducted Alice and brought her to her parents to show her that it is her sister. But I love how that was done. Just... <laughs> You know, perfect, sunny, bright day. And kind of reminded me of the opening credits to the Hills Have Eyes remake. You know, you get these the footage of test bombs, but like these screeching pictures of babies with radiation. It's kind of like that. So like when you see a smiling Alice, it's just cut with a bloodied screaming Alice with staticky VHS quality. Hell of a climax. And we get that's all in her head. And it, so back to what I was saying earlier about how, you know, maybe she's kind of taking things and it's helping form her reality. Like the beast man, and then seeing that in her dreams and stuff. When earlier, when she's in the video store to see if she can get some of Frederick Norris' films, she picks up this one random movie that I think, you know, is a fake one for this movie. And it says, the, the day the world began or something. And it shows this kind of a drawing of, you know, a rainbow over a house, a couple standing there holding hands. It mirrors that final shot. So it's like, and it also kind of goes in with the idea of can certain things, you know, taint someone's mind? Can it corrupt? Or, you know, will people try to make that their reality? Or will it become someone's reality? It does... Now, it, it doesn't feel like it's coming from a place of caution, like don't let people watch these video nasties because they'll become messed up. It sounds like they're against the censorship, but you know, there is that rare case where someone already is kind of messed up. But so yeah, there's like, there's little hints that, of course she's watching these movies all day, every day and And she sees this one cover, maybe that could have, you know, she, she liked how that looked. So that's like her picture perfect reality. But also, if she did kill her sister, and that's what she, you know, cut out of her mind, now her job is cutting out traumatic things out of films. So, and also the side plot with the amnesia killer, she let one film go go out this one guy supposedly which there is another scene where these two characters are talking saying you know he says he never saw deranged 
So how did he get the idea to do it? Kind of playing on how do people do these horrific things without seeing it in a movie? Like, kind of, people don't just do these things. Which I think kind of was the mindset back then. Or that that was the moral panic of back then. And so then people are blaming the censor that let the movie go by. Because if it wasn't for her, he wouldn't have killed his family. But then we find out, he says he never even saw the film. Um, dogs over there sneezing. Been quiet all night, but then... So yeah, I loved this movie. And I, I didn't even really notice it up until that scene with her and Alice in the woods at the end where the aspect ratio is just closing in. And it's in like full Argento mode. Like she's become, her life has become this stylized 80s video nasty essentially. See, so other than, ironically, I keep holding that up. Ironically, other than the two kills, the producer and the man beast actor, which were really the only two things that kind of took me out of it. I thought this was a very well made, very effective movie. It's a great character study. It does a great job at paying homage and tribute to a certain era and style of film while evoking and doing it itself, but also doing its own thing. It's a good, it's a very good, you know, engrossing mystery. You really want to see what happens. I like how they left it ambiguous. They kind of, you know, showed us all that she knows. Very haunting ending. It's, it is, I really like slow burn movies anyway. It doesn't really rely on jump scares. I mean, there's like one jump scare where she's having a dream. It's like she's walking to her house and she enters this one room that has crazy lighting and her mother is back too. And as she approaches her, she quickly turns and yells, it's all your fault. So not many jump scares. So of course, yeah, great score, wonderful atmosphere. So of course, a movie like that isn't gonna get a theatrical release, or at least not a big one. I don't think it did. <laughs> I think it was just straight to festivals and then straight to streaming could be wrong but yet every time a paranormal activity movie or something like that comes out it, it goes to theaters or something like the the prodigy or the turning or whatever but yeah uh, I loved censor and I figured this would be a good time to talk about it I mean it's not exactly a neo giallo or a giallo inspired film but you can definitely see the inspiration there. You can see what they took from it. So it's not going to be in the same playlist as, say, Strange Color Your Body's Tears or Abracadabra or anything like that. But, so yeah, and also, uh, it definitely correct people if you see them calling it Jallo because it's not. But yeah, I, I definitely love this movie. Uh, I thought it was very well made, very effective. Again, I haven't seen a, a climax that haunting in a while. Just all, little snippets of flashes of, of reality that really makes it effective. Yeah, I'm just going to start repeating myself. But yeah, I wanted to see it for a while. I'm glad I checked it out. Very good. And uh, if you stuck through the spoilers... Uh, uh, I still recommend it. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching.